It's like he gave and social constructionists gave um, many different point of view to the to the person and to the therapist. Uh, you can see the world and you can see yourself and you can talk about yourself in several different ways. You don't have a mental heal. You don't um, you don't have this or that you can right. be right. Uh, whatever you you want we, we can say or uh, whatever you want to construct or you are able to construct the therapist is like someone that help you to construct in the way that you prefer or in that direction yeah. um, and, and here you you give us um, um, an answer about about that um, because here, because here there is an, an interesting the, the other phase of the of the coin. Um, always in this book, you talk about um, mental health has oppression. Um, I remember in an interview of Michael Hoyt with Steve DeShazer and John Wickland. Yeah. I think John Wickland says we um, we stopped to be a mental health professional and we start to be a um, mental disease professional. So yeah. what do you mean? Uh, can you give us some example? Uh, you just say something, but can you explore more the way in which um, the mental health can be an oppression? Uh, with the client and in the society. Yeah. Um, there's a way in which that story I was telling about psychiatry and diagnostics yeah. and pharmaceuticals is that story. Yeah. That is, once you assume that whatever is wrong, whatever problems a person has are because they, as an individual, are unhealthy. That kind of medical model. We create label, labels, so we create stories. We label them as unhealthy, and you have this problem, and this problem, yeah. and this problem, and it's inside your head. Yeah. <laughs> you are already at a deficit. I mean, you're already labeled as an, as a, some, an outsider, somebody who's not quite good, who's not quite right. So already you're kind of in a in a bad position. You're badly located. Um, there was not uh, um, ADHD uh, eighty years ago. Fifty. ADHD is a wonderful example. Yeah. There's a case where you're right. There was no ADHD. Why do we have that? I mean, we had children who were very active. We always had that. That doesn't make them ill. And the, but because we've got school systems which demand high, high grades, but now it becomes more and more important that everybody make high grades, pass the test. Now people who don't pass the test must have a mental problem. They're not paying attention and that must be a mental problem. Now, is that what's interesting is that the, the child who's being diagnosed they have no problem. They're, they're perfectly fine about life. That nobody told them they were, you know, they don't come in. Oh God, I'm so, so I'm having such um, a bad time. I can't stand myself. They're not complaining. They're just active. But then the teacher says, well, they're not paying attention. They, and parents say, look, they're not making good grades. Uh, it must be the child. Then you get a psychiatrist to diagnose, diagnose the child. Yeah. And that child is a victim of a school system, a, a grading system, parental ambition, and psychiatry. And, he, and that child had no, no choice. That child will end up eight years later still taking a drug because there's no way to know if he, when he's cured. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, you know, 
we don't have very many ways to tell when somebody when they're they're finished with the illness. Not, not like you know, you, well, I'm glad to see you're not ADHD anymore, or you know, like, well, you have no no indicators. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I have a, a, a girl we, we raised in our family who was um, she was a big her mother committed suicide and her father left her. So she was in bad shape. Um, and we just let her live with us and tried to help her as best we could. And they put her on an anti-anxiety, anti-depression. 20 years later, she's still on an antidepressant. And she wants to have children, but because life has become she knows life only through an antidepressant. She couldn't get off. Mm. It was like dislocating. So that's where it becomes oppressive. Yeah. And it becomes oppressive when that's the only the only way we have of treating people. The only way we have of helping them is when you have these assumptions, you lock it into insurance systems, you lock it into big advertising and the mental health programs in the country, International Mental Health Week. I mean, all this is setting people up to say, if I have something wrong with me, I must be mentally ill or something. I must have a problem. You know, perhaps it's the school that has a problem, for example, with a kid. Yeah. Perhaps it's a, you're depressed at work. Maybe it's the way work work-life functions. It is depressing. There was a saying in, in Poland once a long time ago that if, if you're not depressed, you don't see the world correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I really would like to talk about this topic for many hours uh, you, you aware me you aware me um i have to do a, a last question um it's very as, as i said before it's very disruptive so it's very difficult it seems to me to many people to many professionals to see things in this way you know um i think me too uh for a long time uh, sometimes um, sometimes uh, just now actually um, but many professionals say you know um, no, this is not true I have data I have uh, um, studies about uh, effectiveness uh, efficiency and I can prove that this therapy is better from this other therapy even if now we have many studies that says to us that um, all the therapies seems uh, the same about efficacy uh, maybe they not are the same about uh, um, the the, uh, the duration of therapy but this is another story so um i think that's a reason is that uh, how to say it's 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 more easy and it's more common to think in a not social construction in ways to say this is a glass and it's a glass for everyone and for everywhere and forever and uh, even if I can't say maybe you can say it better that in, in, in the present we are living there are some seeds that can that we can embrace social construction as perspective. But what I want to ask is, what do you see in the present and in the future of social constructionism and of psychotherapy with social constructionism? Let me say a little bit about, about social construction and then go back to therapy in particular. I think for a lot of us who got into these ideas a number of years ago, we have begun to turn to, the, to a way of looking at life in terms of relational process. Yeah. Um, all right, now that's not a small thing because it, 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 it 
shifts the ground from the from the talking that is let me try to be clear i think with that first wave of social construction when it came into therapy it said if you change the way of talking okay what you talk about how you talk about it where you focus change the narrative change the story was very language oriented no. that is if we change the language yeah we change the person or i think if you go into this relational perspective that i think a lot of us have are going you you realize that the changing the language is you don't change it permanently it's continuously moving mm-hmm. you change a narrative at one point well it's still the person's in process in dialogue you change the way they think about the future or the way they are proposing to go on that can change in a moment so you can't you can't freeze the therapeutic outcome because it's too language based let's say what if we tried to talk about the relational process that one steps out of the office and into the moment the person leaves your office and goes home or goes in back into a bad family situation or a complex emotional life a bad workplace all those things they step in the process so for me and I, what i see as a future here is to trying to pay more attention to how to help people to engage in that process in those set of relationships hmm. um let me just a brief example for example yeah. i what if i what if i came away from a narrative therapy and i realized um that it's that it's not um that people don't like me which i thought it's that um i don't know i don't i don't seek love from people i i should go out and and ha- and have a loving relationship i don't try that is i came in thinking nobody loves me i'm change the story no people don't dislike you what you are this is a new story you're not trying to generate loving relationships okay okay now here's the problem how do i generate a loving relationship hmm. how to do that what do i say what do i do how do i look what words do i use where do, what clothes do i wear and oh that's a how to engage in the social process yeah it's a it's an action it's a set of actions and words are some of those actions but much more complicated than just having words it's a way how to do complex social life how to how to relate to a boss who really is uh, tyrannical mm-hmm. how to relate to a spouse who seems to be criticizing you all the time how to relate to a son who is having drug issues it's that how to engage in the social process and that to me is to me the future because we've got a really complex cultural changes that are happening all the time you do we do partly digital world we're in it's continuously moving values ways of life uh what people do what they care about under continuous change how do you how do you survive how do you thrive in that multiplicity yeah. that's that to me is the, the question i continuously raise now how do i do that how do you do it can you help me to do it better i mean for example you as a therapist are trained in relationship and you 
read about it, you watch videos, you talk to people, people have watched you, you've observed, you are well trained to have those special relationships. Yeah. What if we help other people to be able to have complex relationships? Um, anyway, I, so I'm trying to move then from a changing simply the language we come away with to looking at therapy as a way of enabling people to engage in the process of relating itself. It sounds big and it sounds, yeah, yeah, that's uh, challenging in a good way. I mean, um, I see what narrative therapy are doing. I, I practice solution focus uh, therapy and other kind of therapies that um, um, put their hands in social construction uh, theories, social construction values, and I think that's the future. I think that's uh, something that must be teach it, teaching uh, teachers in all the um, psychology faculty, um, and I hope it will be uh, in this way in everyone and soon. Uh, hey even in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, yeah, yeah. I, but it's exciting to think, you know, it's like, uh, therapy to me is a, is a critical, um, or really central, um, uh, profession yeah. because it's one of those few professions that really plays a role in social life, yeah. creating a cult. And so, continuously reflecting on therapy, what that's like and what it does, enormously important. Yeah. And, and not to not to come down on one school, this is the way it's going to be, and this is the way it always must be. That, that's killing. Uh, keep reflection, which is what you're doing with your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I totally agree. I think this is the longest interview I had and it's not long enough to me um, I hope to see you soon in uh, Italy or everywhere and yeah, that would be nice. thank you Professor and, uh, Gergen up in a, a cooler month oh yeah <laughs> I hope it's so <laughs> thank you Professor Gergen and have a nice day yeah, good luck to you thank you you too